Joey, do you know what I love? Protein bars. More than protein bars. <laughs> Your wife. I do love my wife. I love her a lot. That was for you, Megan. <laughs> <laughs> I love it when people <laughs> kick the 401k to the curb. No doubt, man. Get you fired up, doesn't it? I love it when people see how passive income is the true way to financial freedom and that putting money into 401ks and IRAs is a prison. 100%. This episode today is just like inspiring to me how our community member, another story, another amazing story of someone who said, I want to be financially free. And that means I need to create cash flow. Decided he wanted to go down the road of building cash flow and was hit a roadblock because of his 401k. Yeah, he found out that his money was actually not his money. It was in the lockbox. It's in the, the lock- prison. It can't get it out. No way, no how. Thankfully, a window opened. You'll get a chance to hear how that happened. And it, there's maybe a way for you to participate in that same process. But also, Joey, it's just it's just a good feeling to know that one other person is becoming financially free. And this story is one that you need to listen to. Let's jump in with our interview with Jake Jernigan. Welcome to the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast, your guide to understanding how to get out of the Wall Street rat race and start your own mailbox money lifestyle. Now, don't let these handsome Southern draws fool you. These financial minds are teaching our country to enhance savings, increase cash flow, and create passive income, all without the help of Wall Street. Are you ready to break through? Now here are your hosts, Russ Morgan and Joey Murray. Hey, welcome back to the show. We have a great, great opportunity here to interview Jake Jernigan. Jake, so glad to have you here. Thanks, guys, man. I'm pumped to be here. Thanks for for coming on to the show. I know this isn't your everyday gig, right? You're not a, a average podcast uh, guest or, or or host. So um, for us to have someone like yourself to come on and just like tell what you are doing, I think it's so valuable for the listener. And I, I want to dig into your story, but if it's all right, I'm going to kind of start with maybe the future in mind and then go to the past. Is that cool? Yeah, that works for me, man. I'm I'm usually on the uh, the listening side of the podcast, so I'm ready to be see what it's like on this side. Yeah, well, wait till you listen to yourself. You're going to be like, man, I sound so amazing. At least that's what I say. <laughs> All right, so tell me a little bit, like, what is the goal for the Jernican family? Like, if you're looking into the future, like, if everything that you're doing right now continues to work, what does that look like? I want to, like, paint the vision and paint the picture for the person listening real quick. Sure, man. Yeah, so the, the Jernigan family goal is is time freedom. Um, and then, you know, passive income, I think will help us get to that time freedom. And we really just, we want to have time with our kids, maybe to go sporting events when they're older, um, go to all their, you know, anything that after school, uh, maybe travel with them to places I didn't get to go growing up, you know, different stuff like that. Just to have the freedom to, to make choices, I think is our broad goal. You, you, you mentioned something in there to do things that you didn't get to do when you were growing up. Tell me more about that. Yeah. So my, my parents were awesome. They, my mom was a teacher, third grade. My dad was a police officer. So they had uh, tough underpaid jobs and they did great. You know, I didn't have a hard child or anything growing up, but we didn't really do any kind of crazy travel. We didn't do, um, you know, any international travel. I love, I love my kids to maybe to see a little bit of international stuff as well. That's awesome. Well, and and I think that that's what has to drive us, right? There's a, something bigger behind us. So I'm, I'm glad you started with what does, we, we asked this in the community, what would you be doing if you were not trading time for money? And so that gives us a picture of what, what you're kind of headed after. Now, when did you start to realize that, hey, there's a, a path that is going to get me there? When did it click? Like, give us an idea of when that happened. Sure. So uh, my previous employer, they had um, a 401k where you could take loan withdrawals against the 401k. 
So then I moved to a different employer and just rolled it in, rolled my 401k to the new one. And I still had buddies at the previous employer. So they were uh, flipping diesel trucks and they were taking loans on their 401k to do it. And I was talking to them and I was really wanting to get into rentals. So I was like, I found a single family rental I wanted to buy. Didn't have enough cash for it, but I knew my 401k, if I could take a loan, perfect. You know, no problem. There's the cash. So when I contacted my new employer's 401k provider, they said, no, no loans. You can't, we don't do any kind of loan um, programs. And I was like, oh no. I was like, but that can't be the answer. So I looked and I found some information online that a lot of times your rollover, you could still have access to because that's not from the current employer. So I was like, hey, I found this. Do you got, can I get access to my rollover money there? Actually, no, you can't. <laughs> so the answer is still no. And I was like, man, all right, this isn't working for me. Like I need to get, you know, some access to some money and I can't with my 401k. So that, that's kind of where I started. All right. But, but back up even further than that, there was something that made you interested even in getting into this rental home that you found this opportunity. You heard these guys talking about flipping diesel trucks, which by the way, let's, let's talk to that. Let's, you know, let's <laughs> New idea. The, just hit put that in the pipeline. Um, but, but what talk me through, like, what was it that made you even interested in the, the rental side of things? Sure. So the rental, um, I was interested because of one, the mailbox money that I heard about, which is, you know, it's a little bit harder than mailbox money, but, um, you know, there's a lot of tax benefits as well to the rentals. Um, you know, the, the getting leveraged money where you're only putting a small amount down and the tenants paying your mortgage down for you. So there's a lot of things that I thought early on would help me you know, get to where I wanted to be. And I thought, you know, single family or small rentals would help me get there. And your, your kind of background, what is it that you do for a living? Uh, I sell heating and air conditioning. So commercial, we do university, hospitals, big stuff. And you, you mentioned kind of growing up in an everyday uh, house, kind of like mine, your parents, I think you mentioned before the show were like teachers, police officers, stuff like that. That's correct. Yep. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So did you guys, did your parents own rental property or did they like invest in like side businesses outside of the, the mainstream stuff? No, they didn't. Um, I, I don't know where I got it from, to be honest. <laughs> it, it, you know, they always encouraged me to learn more. And, uh, and, you know, be outside the box, but they never did anything. They both had, you know, pension plans. So, yeah, um, they, they pretty much relied on those. Well, and that's, that's most people don't realize that, yeah, we, we learn all this stuff from our parents, right? But our parents, where did, you know, they were in a different situation. Like your parents had a pension. My mom was a teacher as well, right? She graduated, she finished, um, you know, her working career with a state retirement and check right. keeps coming regardless. And, and there's that that changed in the early 80s with the new 401k rules and stuff that came out and companies started doing away with pensions. Right. And and unless you worked in a government related role, you didn't have access to that. How I'm sorry, Joe, you get you. Get, well, jump I, in here. I, I feel like I want to I don't want to miss this. You just talk through you have an opportunity that's right there. It's waiting on you to fund. You go into your pile of cash that, you know, you can access. And somebody says, no. Yeah, I didn't like it. Like what, what went through your mind at that moment? And then I want to leverage that into another question. But first of all, what was going through your mind right when you heard that? I, I just thought like, you know, how is this possible? You know, if I didn't really understand the difference between one employer and the other, I just, from the, from my very limited experience, I was only at the first uh, company for two years. Um, so I just assumed everybody's 401k, you get a loan against it. And then I was just, uh, I was, I don't know, I wasn't sure what to do because I was, I was sure that I was going to get the money and I was going to go buy my first rental house. And so immediately you're thinking, what do, what do I do from here? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. I'm like, how am I going to get, you know, the money for this? You know, I don't have it personally. You know, yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't know what I was going, where I was going to get the money, and I ended up not. I didn't do the deal. You don't have it personally. Did, like, did you hear what he just said? Well, the part I just heard him say at the end was, because I, I was about to ask, so what did you do? And the answer was, I didn't do the deal. Yeah. Yeah. There's it, no... it, delayed, it delayed me probably two years. You know, I was kind of discouraged. And uh, it probably delayed me from getting my first house by about two years. First rental house. I mean, okay, I'm sorry if I'm like camping out on this, but like Russ and I are just on this kick right now. <laughs> 
access to cash is king. It is. 100%. Literally, it wasn't your cash anymore. Like you just said, I'm the one that put up all the money. I'm taking all the risk of where it's being invested. Yep. And I have zero access. Like that opportunity is somebody else's now. Yep. Yep. I've given and it up till age 65 or so. Yeah. I'm not trying to put salt in your wound. I'm literally saying the person is driving down the road, listen to us right now, thinking that they are doing all the things that they're supposed to do. They're checking the boxes. They're, they've gone to school. They've got the good job. They're making extra money. They have a surplus. They're putting it away into this, this quote unquote savings plan that is completely an investment plan. And now they, they just wait, maybe woke up to the same thing that you just did. And they're like, that's not my money. Yeah. I mean, I think if, if you're on the going to be on the investor side, like you guys are like, you know, I am, it's, it's a terrible plan. I think there are maybe some people that it's okay for if you're just not a saver and it'll force you to save maybe. Um, but other than that, uh, I'm, I'm out. All right. So tell to us about, okay. So you just went through that moment. You were <laughs> told you, you, you're not going to be able to do this. Right. And as you mentioned, it pushed you back two years. So what, what happened in that next two years? What did you start doing differently or what did, what, what was the result of being told no? Well, I, I wish I had a, a better response, but you know, I just kept funding it. Um, Cause that's pretty much all I knew. That's mm. all anyone else around me was doing. Um, and then I met a guy that we ended up talking real estate together. Uh, and, and that's kind of what got me going again. And him and I ended up partnering on the first house. So then that kind of helped me with my funding um, issues. And then you know, from there, it kind of snowballed. And then I was looking for more options. Like there's got to be something else besides a 401k. So what did you find? Uh, I found the IBC, found IBC policies. Um, I looked real, real hard into those because I felt like, why, why wouldn't have anyone told me about this? If I can get a guaranteed... 4% return. And I think, you know, people are saying 401k, you want to average six to 8% a year. Um, you know, like if I can just get a guaranteed 4% and my principal is not at risk, why would I save my cash there? And I just, I, I thought, I really thought that there's no way that it was a real deal. Well, by, by the way, where did you even hear the concept? It was on a podcast. Um, man, I listen to podcasts all the time. Um, it was a real estate investing podcast and someone had come on to talk about IBC and I was really like, wait, what? No way. No, no way. Cause you know, if you can keep your money growing and you can go invest it and it's going to compound over here while I'm still buying a rental house over here. I was like, this is a no brainer. There got there was like, there has to be a catch. That's literally so what I thought came, when I heard. Yeah. So you came home and you told your wife, look, I got it figured out. We're going to put money in life insurance. You're not going to believe this. All right. We're not going to invest in our 401ks anymore. Okay. We're not doing it. We're going to buy some whole life policies. (laughs) Oh, man. What was her initial response to that? Well, she she knows I'm a little, uh, I'll see like a shiny object. And I'm like, oh, that's it. That's, that's the one. And uh, so she, she keeps me grounded. Um, So I got to come to her with, you know, some real details. I can't just be pie in the sky ideas i have to say you know here's some real stuff that i found on it here's what i think is going to work um and uh she's definitely the uh the the less of a risk taker than i am so it's a good it's a good match so you had to do some research you had to give her some numbers it couldn't just be wholly conceptual to her talk about some of those things you did because there's there's someone listening to you right now that's wanting to tell their spouse about this and they're like jake give me some tips like help me figure out like what 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 plan should i take they don't want to walk into the whack-a-mole game you know yeah i'd love to give you the perfect strategy but it's tough um i think it's in my benefit that march 2020 just happened um you know we watched our both our 401ks drop by 30 or 40 percent whatever it ended up being at that time and you know i think the being less of a risk taker, it, she, she started to see that, you know, okay, I can't lose my principal in this whole life policy, but I mean, my 401k I literally just saw 30% in a month gone. Yeah. So that, I think the timing helped. The timing was, was really good for me to, to start talking to her about whole life policies. Um, yeah. I, I don't, I don't have the, the perfect answer for everybody's spouse, but man, it was, uh, I think, 
I think when they get past the, you know, why, why have I never heard about this and why are people only talking to me about 401ks? Um, and I think illustrations help. You know, I took some of the illustrations that JD gave me to her. Um, so, yeah. Let me, let me ask you this. Yeah. Did whenever you were trying to get that first rental property and going through your 401k and it didn't work out, how, did your wife, how did she respond to that from a standpoint? Because we're talking about risk taking. In sure. this case, you don't have access to your money. Like, does that equate with her at that point? Or she just see that as a sign that you weren't supposed to buy the property? Um, it's probably a mix, man. I, I'll tell you, I still drive by that house probably twice a week and it gets me every time I'm like, there's that house. I should own that house. I should own that house mm. right now, but it's, it gets me still. But, uh, yeah, back, back to your question. Um, I think since it was already investment money, you know, in the 401k, um, I think she was okay with me investing it. It'd just be, you know, instead of investing in the mutual fund, I'd be investing in real estate with it. It's kind of like already allocated, you know, for investments. But did she, did she feel the same way you did that, man, I thought you could get access to it and you, now you can't like something's wrong here. Um, I don't, I don't know. I don't think she did. I think she thought, well, you know, it's a different plan. Um, it, you know, real, it might be a little risky anyway, because we <laughs> both, her and I both went through the 08, 09. So she's, she's still like, is real estate too risky kind of stuff? Yeah. So that, that's why I wanted to start, you know, with one single family to kind of, you know, make sure, show her that it worked, get her comfortable with it. Well, and that's the thing is that we we are exposed to it for so long that it becomes normal, right? right? Even the volatility becomes normal. Even the lack of access to cash becomes normal because if everybody else around us is doing it, then it must be good, right? It's just one right, living call and another it. living off the hill. Yeah, don't don't even check it. You know, if you want to look once a year, you can kind of glance at it, but don't worry. You know, you have plenty of time in the market. You're yeah. not going to oh, retire till 65, so don't worry. It'll come back. Are you looking for ways to implement ideas, get exposure to new ones, and be surrounded by people on the same journey as you? Joey, where can they go to do that? Go to wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash community. You can join for free today. Oh, man, I love the don't worry about it. Like, don't worry, don't worry about it. It doesn't matter if it goes down and goes up. It doesn't matter. Like, you've got time. It, it's so easy to just keep putting it in every month. It's so easy. Oh, you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, and if we roll back to, had you had that existing that that property, you would have bought it and started two years earlier. How much more cash flow would you have today because of that? Man, I can't. It, it would, I don't know if I had one. You know, then I'd had to have two, and then year yeah. two, I'd probably had to have four. So who yeah. knows? Man, I'd, I'd have I'd have more doors, and and I would have my real estate journey would have started earlier, just like the compound interest curve. It would have, it would have started earlier and I would have ramped up faster. And I love the way you said that because that really is what happens, right? Once we start doing these things and we set our mind on this opportunity is what I'm after, our brain starts working for us. That reticular activating system is now focused in on opportunities. There's no doubt yeah. that you would have had more. So how many properties do you have now? Um, I'm partnered up on uh, five single families and a triplex here locally. And then I'm in a, uh, syndication on a 48 unit in Winston Salem, North Carolina. And man, once we got to multifamily, I was like, I'm done with single family, but that, that's part of the, the real estate journey. You know, you gotta, you gotta start, you know, wherever you start, but, um, yeah. So now we're, we're looking at more multifamily stuff. What, what's important to you about multifamily? What do you like um, about it? It's, so, you know, on a single family house, if you, if you're vacant, you're vacant, you know, you're a hundred, a hundred percent or you're zero percent full. Um, and in a multifamily, you get, you get a little bit more, um, opportunity to have some vacancy and you don't even notice it. Um, the single family, uh, is more valued by the local real estate market. Mm. And then multifamily is all based on, you know, what you did to the property, how much money you're making. So you can, kind of control the value of your property if you can control expenses. That's so good. So let me let me ask a, a little bit deeper question. You mentioned that like the natural thing is, hey, just keep putting money in this 401k because you're not going to retire to your 65 anyway, right? That's right. That, 
on your journey, has anything changed with you and your wife as you guys kind of talk about what you're doing now versus that old plan? Like, are y'all thinking differently about that at this point? Oh yeah. I've, I've got her on board now. You know, we, we were originally hoping like, you know, maybe if we, you know, we max those 401ks out, maybe 60, you know, maybe we can treat ourselves to a 60 year old, but um, I keep pushing her every year. I'm like, we can do it a year sooner. We can, you know, got her down to 55. Like how about 50? You know, like I'm like uh, an auctioneer. I'm like, do I got 50? Do I get 45? Yeah. <laughs> we're trying to get her down. So, um, you know, once you see the passive income coming in, um, especially staying as a W2 employee also, you know, I think it, it's possible. And is she getting excited through that? Like, is she dreaming with you now? Like, I know you said that you're kind of the the dreamer of the group. Is she is she dreaming? Is she seeing those vacations with families? Is she seeing the ability to do travel with the sports and stuff with the kids because of what the passive income from these um, units and uh, investments that you have coming in are, are providing? Yeah, that's right. You know, luckily I did start off, you know, one at a time, to, you know, you know, to keep her like, you know, okay, you know, don't, I don't want to push her too far out of her comfort zone, you know, but I got to give her a little bit of a push every now and then. Um, and then she's also got to keep me grounded at the same time. So I don't go too wild, but um, yeah, she's definitely come around. She sees it at work. You know, she sees the uh, tax returns where, you know, you, your depreciation's offsetting all of your income. And then she sees our W-2 income uh, where it's fully taxed and there's no breaks. So uh, she, she sees it. Well, and that's the part we've covered that in our in our tax part of our Freedom Seekers class is the way that you're taxed, right? When you're in the E quadrant and you're a W two worker, you know you can pay as much as forty percent tax. Oh, it's right? gross! It's gross. Yeah, it, it's it's sick, right? You know, and the person who first starts, right? Like they 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 see their check and they're like, "Wait a sec, what happened?" Right? That's <laughs> the reason why we're. They're teaching our kids about how money works. Like, never get like tell them you're going to pay them twenty dollars and give them fifteen. And like, I thought you were going to give me twenty. Like, the file was taxes. When, like, I first came out of, uh, when I first came out of school, I, I uh, got paid monthly. So my very first check, I was like, "Yes, yeah, check time. Let's go." Opened it up. I was like, "Wait a minute. Wait, wait, where did it all go?" And you started looking. Like, oh no, because <laughs> you know you don't get the every two week check where it's not as noticeable, but you get paid once a month and you you notice. <laughs> yeah, they got big, huge chunk. Well, speaking of kids, I do want to talk about that. You mentioned that you you had two children, two and four, right. and and before we press record, you mentioned that you guys were starting to think about their future. Talk about the discussion that uh, happened and how that discussion has evolved. Yep. So I started my policy uh, late last year, and uh, and I heard on probably y'all's podcast that the some a lot of a lot of people start a second policy within the first year. I was like, I don't know. I think I'm, I'm, I'm probably good for a while with mine. JD set me up right, uh, and then my wife and I started talking about five two nine, and we we brought it up before. But you know, my son was younger, and my daughter just got here. And you know, when you get kids, like the time just flies by. You're like, Did we talk about that last week, or was it last year? I'm not sure. Um, but so we brought up five two nine plans, and and I said, hold on, what about? policies on the kids and she's like well, why would you want a policy on your on your kids and i was like no 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 it's not it's not like a policy on the kids instead of the 529 plan we would just put the money in the whole life policy instead and save that way so that that's currently our uh, our discussion now so we got to call jd to talk about that well and i love that because what what she did as far as the response is very very typical is people just immediately think life insurance they think why would we want a death benefit? There's like this morbidity kind of yeah. aspects like, wow, that just feels wrong. Like it's not, it's not right. But when you compare it to the aspects that you want your money to do, like a 529, what, what's the purpose? Well, I want to save for my kids college. I want to give them a, a leg up, like, and I want it to, to be growing. I want the tax benefits. Like, oh, these, these are good things. But when we look at what else you can do with the whole life insurance in place of that, like I imagine you guys had some conversations about that. That's right. Yeah. So in uh, Virginia, it might have been last year, the year before, there used to be a plan where you could lock in the tuition rate, which is obviously more attractive if it's going to grow 10% or whatever they're projecting per year. But now it's gone. And the only 5 to 9 plan option is like a mutual fund type option. So your principal is not even protected for your kid's college. You know, you could you could lose money. 
in your 529 plan. Yeah. Imagine your, your kid is getting ready to go off to college in March of 2020. <laughs> right. I don't, want to. don't make me. Yeah. I mean, now you're like forced to sell at 40, 30, 40% loss to pay, you know, that, that if they're going to go to school that summer, you're paying tuition in, in March or April. Mm-hmm. And, and so now you're forced to sell the investment at a 30 to 40% loss. You don't have the ability that time when you're paying for college, you don't have the, they're only there during that time. So you have to pay for it regardless of where the market is. And, and there's so many studies that go into talking about when we buy and sell in an investment ultimately dictates its return. And when you have to sell in down markets or sell the year after a down market, when the market typically is rising, right? Well, that's what we've seen in 2021. And we saw the, the market rise after the downturn in the you know early part of 2020. Well, you want the, the ability to take advantage of that. But if you're having to sell it, you don't get that upswing. So all of those averages that Wall Street lies to us about only only uh, pertains to the endowment funds, right? Like if you're Harvard and you got all this money in there and you're not touching it, yeah, that's perfect. That, that math makes total sense. But when you're actually having to use it to pay for the college at that time, you, you could win, but you could lose. And like you said, the last thing – you want to do is oh man we put money in here we actually lost money for our kids college it actually it it, it hurt their 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 college situation not helped it that's right yeah so um i think one of the big points too is you know when you pull that money in the 529 plan it's gone the plan's mm-hmm. over you're done you pay for college that's the end well if you pull it out of the whole life policy it's going to keep growing it's going to keep compounding and, and in 20 years on that compound growth curve I mean, they're going to be doing, the, our kids are going to be doing really, really well at that point. Well, and I don't know, have you ever watched, uh, I know being a client, you have access to our inner circle. And if you're listening to this podcast, you're not a member of our inner circle. Even if you're not a client, you can just join. You can go to wealthwhitewallstreet.com forward slash inner circle and join and, and get access to these tools. Have you watched the the case study that we did within the IBC 201 on actually paying for college and other things? I have, yeah. I've done a bunch of your uh, your inner, um, inner circle trainings. They're great. Yeah. I recommend if anybody isn't even sure, even, you know, you can sign up without paying and, and still get access to a bunch of the 101 content. Yeah, no, that that's so awesome. When you get to see, like, what you're talking about is building an asset, is that, yeah, I can use this at, this insurance policy to help pay for the college, but later down the line, you can give this asset to the kid. And even make them accountable to paying back the loans that they took out, which only enhances how much access to cash they have to buy their first house, to you know buy their first investment property, to buy their start a business. First business. Yeah. I mean, they're just like the the opportunities are endless when you've created a pool of cash. And that's like you said, Joey, that's what we have constantly found, Jake, is that most people aren't able to take advantage of deals, not because they don't understand deals, but they don't have access to cash just like you had. So Jake, this has been, been really good. I really appreciate you coming in and sharing. I know we could have this conversation all day long, but uh, I know you, you actually work for a living and you don't get paid to do this. So I, I want right, to be a good right. your time. Um, I hope you will uh, share this with, with lots of your friends and say, hey, by the way, you guys know that I am a podcast listener and I'm a podcast guest as well. Oh, I definitely will. I definitely will. I, already, I bother everybody in the office already talking to them about whole life policies. So. <laughs> they, probably, they probably think I'm an insurance agent. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm going to end it on this, though. So, Jake, you've got a 10-year goal to get to – how much, how much is your passive income goal in the next 10 years? That's right. Um, uh, I'm hoping that I can get to, so I told Joey this, but uh, I'd started at 5,000. I was like, I, I want to get, if I can get to $5,000 a month without me having to work for it, like I'm set. And then I saw, you know, 10X, you know, 10X book. Uh, and I was like, wow, 50 grand. I don't know, 50 grand. I was like, all right, let me just do 25. So my lofty goal is 25, but, you know, even if I, even if I fall short, you know, I'm, I'm going to be doing good. That's awesome. And so for, for any last thoughts for somebody that's listening that has maybe been on the fence about uh, IBC or this journey of kind of going out of your comfort zone, because ultimately you had to break a lot of um, thought processes, like ways that people have been trained to think about money and financial freedom and all these things. Like, 
somebody that's stuck in that right now but wants to break out or wants to take the step in IBC, what are any last thoughts for somebody like that? Yeah, I mean, I did a, a ton of research. I listened to probably every single one of y'all's podcasts, any podcast that I get my hands on, any YouTube video I get my hands on. Um, and, you, and you meet, you get to see a lot of different personalities. Um, I probably talked to three different companies before I got to you guys. And I think it's about finding somebody you're comfortable with and you get a good fit. And I got that with you guys. Um, and JD specifically is who I, who I've work, worked with and he's great. So I think, you know, if you really look into this, you, you're going to find out that it, it doesn't even compare to a 401k. Mm-hmm. It's not even close. Um, you know, I'm a W2 employee. I'm not a business owner. I'm like a normal guy. Um, and, and I wish I would have found out about it. I wish somebody had told me about it as soon as I started working and I could have been, had a policy started when I was 22 or my parents started one for me. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I heard y'all say this, but it's, you know, the best day was yesterday, but you know, today, today's now the best day. So start uh, one. Uh, that's awesome. And I love the fact that you said, I wish my parents would have done that because I know that's going into your your planning and thought process to your kids as it is for us. So thank you again, Jake, for being willing to come on the show and share. And, and thank you for listening to this episode. And I, I hope just like Jake, that you're you're willing to take that next step, that you're willing to go against the grain and and follow your dreams. What do you want for your family? Do you want the ability to travel? Do you want to share things with your your kids that maybe you didn't have when you were growing up, just like we did and just like Jake did, then then take action. Jump on a a call. Um, Our coaches are willing to do a 15-minute coaching call just to help you get clarity. You go to wealthwhitewallstreet.com forward slash free call. And in that time frame, you're going to get to have a a one-on-one conversation with somebody just like Jake did, whether it's with JD, with Ernie, or with Mark, to help you understand what does financial freedom look like and how far away is it really? Does it have to be age 65 or could it be much, much, much sooner? So thank you so much for joining us. Thanks again, Jake, for being on the podcast. We'd love to. Uh, Thank you guys, man. Had an awesome time. This has been the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the show to break free of the Wall Street mindset and begin building wealth on your own terms in places you understand so that your wealth will never run dry. See you next episode.